Hi, and welcome to our fifth and final meeting of the Blue Ocean Shift Discussion Group. Today we're going to be talking about part two, step five, make your move, which um, are the chapters 12 and 13 in Blue Ocean Shift. And I'm going to be leading this uh, last meeting and we're going to be going over questions um, that are both uh, looking at these final chapters and hopefully um, also a retrospective look back at the entire book, our impressions and takeaways, um, with the ultimate goal of ending after one hour, just like Melanie was able to accomplish on her <laughs> for her last meeting. That's my goal too. So. With that, um, should we just start at the first question, you guys, or should we, do we need to recap anything? Uh, 30 second recap. We did several sessions, uh, roughly once per week, roughly two chapters per session. And uh, someone could trans give a transcription and it would be very interesting. Because we discovered the book uh, ourselves week by week instead of reading it all at one in one go. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, feel free in the comments um, section of, you know, I've created a, a YouTube channel for all five webcasts. Well, this fifth one will go up today. Um, but hopefully they'll be of use, um, whether people like them or don't like them, for people who want to read the book going forward and sort of see a group of people from around the world, um, mostly in tech, but in varied, from varied backgrounds, talk about... Um, our experience going through these, uh, through the book, and um, you know, I think for me, just before we start, um, I'm really grateful that you know you guys, you know, Pete, Melanie, Leo, uh, y'all, especially, we just like hung in there and we just kept going because I honestly don't believe that I would have made it through the book on my own and, or absorbed it as well, and so I feel like from the standpoint of me doing this experiment that it was I learned how to make it better but I definitely learned from the process of of, of it so thank you guys thank you yeah, yeah. Really fun. it was a good experiment Jamie yeah. um, by the way in the very first episode we, we, we mentioned the word humanist and humanness and then in the last chapter I saw those two words were in the same paragraph together <laughs> <laughs> our, our initial confusion was valid between humanist and humanness. Pretty funny. And I think that just underscores the point, too, that you really um, read these books carefully when you are reading in a book uh, book club in a group like this. So even noticing little distinctions like that is not something you normally do when you're skimming through a book casually on your own. Yeah. I actually feel like I'm going to have to go through the audiobook one more time and take notes as I do for like a full path. So for me, it's actually an opportunity to have the first pass with you guys and have a very focused observation for the second one. And I, I do plan to use it very soon. I have an opportunity to work on this in the company I'm working for. So it's going to be interesting. Definitely. All right, well, let's go through our questions and then we can sort of talk about um, the book as a whole and even uh, how we might go forward using some of the techniques in the book. So why don't we start with Pete? Number one. Cool, okay, so um, I can't see my question on screen, but I'm pretty sure I know. Oh, I'll share it's screen, a, I'm sorry. It's okay, sorry. I mean, I, I think essentially I was just quite, um, I suppose surprise is maybe the best word to, to read early in the chapter, um, the first chapter we were covering, that um, so many people were being invited to this Blue Ocean Fair, and in particular what got my interest was the fact that they were, um, the authors were, recommending you bring people from outside the company to the fair as well um, which you know get, that nicely follows their um, theme of going out and engaging with the market to get um, feedback from them or it um, which is great um, but at this point it seems like you're making some pretty business critical decisions and discussing quite a lot of commercial sensitive information like what the cost base is and, and where your added value is going to come in and one to me, that seems quite, um, that 
I would not be comfortable sharing that with an external audience um, for many reasons. Um, one of which is potentially just setting expectations, because I, I think that's hard enough to manage internal expectations about what these strategies will actually walk into when they're delivered. But if you if you get a load of external people in there and say, yeah, this is the winning strategy, they're going to go away thinking, well, you know, in six months' time, that's what we're going to be coming to talk to us about. Um, and it's in a very raw, unpolished, uh, unpolished format. So, just yeah, I, I, I would be keeping my cards a lot closer to my chest at that duration fair personally. But I was just trying to work out what would be the reasons for getting external people in, and I couldn't think of any good ones. So, I wonder if you guys had any thoughts. Um, uh, when, when I was in that, I, I thought, the, especially in tech, everyone's so secretive, right? So I can't imagine anyone letting outsiders into a blue ocean strategy conference that's supposed to set them apart from the competition. So I think it was great that they did because that provides such a unique, uh, you know, like we talked about earlier, a perspective that's not within your own echo chamber, but I just don't see how that would ever happen. So. Yeah. Maybe you can let them in, but you just don't let them out again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like a cult. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I moved my question up just because it follows yours, Pete, in between Melanie's, but I thought this whole idea of this blue ocean fair, not very realistic. I just can't imagine... I mean, you know, like that, you know, I'm trying to imagine the dynamics of, oh, we're going to have these groups work part time and come up with these ideas. Like, where are they going to get all these resources and dedicate them in this way? And maybe it's like a version of doing applying design thinking, but divide and conquering and uh, and then present them kind of in a, you know, in this sort of I'm imagining a room. You know, kind of like I've been to some design thinking where, you know, you go from like, here, here's our concept to another concept and the executives are, you know, they said many times it's important that these executives don't leave, that their presence there is absolutely critical for people to be taken seriously. And, you know, it just sounds like a very expensive endeavor. And while I love the idealism behind it, I just... Can I mean if I was hired as a strategist at many companies and I said we're going to do this, you know I I don't know maybe an insider would have to do it. I, I just feel like maybe it, it's something that's just kind of dreamy. Well, I had the same concerns if we can call it this way, especially about the mind space that executives can have to follow through, and it's I'm always bringing up the question of. How do you select the, the blue, the kind of innovating directions for the blue ocean and whether the executives can take part in making these decisions of which one to select if they haven't been involved in formulating them and understanding well what are the structural and, and innovative directions that are behind them. It sounds more like uh, the process needs to happen without them and then they're presented with <coughs> That's what we think that should be done, and they, with their limited time and resources, can approve or decline, like they typically do. An another thing I was thinking about this too is, so it could be the best project in the world or the worst, but if you're on a team that has a stellar presenter, mm. think how great the job is at presenting, that's going to tip the scale big time, and that's kind of unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. So. Uh, I agree with Jamie. This is idealistic, and on paper it sounds fantastic, but there are a lot of different little variables that can stack up to kind of undermine this big fair and the entire blue ocean strategy that they went through. Yeah, I think what you just said at the end about the presenter kind of ties in with my question, which we'll get to later, but thinking about who's invited, like there could be value to having customers and non-customers, you know, or sort of like research participants that you recruited to come to this because then you would be getting some sort of like market feedback on the the more developed ideas yeah if they can be expressed in a way i don't think a regular customer non-customer would understand looking at one of these canvases or 
by utility maps that would make no sense and maybe showing them a prototype if there's if it's possible like the toilet paper uh business case but i feel like it's such high level strategy and that i mean just think of like a regular person a regular customer yeah. they're just right. going to jump into this thing and i mean i think it, that's why we have focus groups would it make sense to if it if it's too complicated or, or the kind of user journey is too overarching so instead of putting the prototype in front of uninitiated potential users to put a story mm. and can yeah. help them envision themselves within the whole process not just the final piece well a, a story can be a prototype sometimes an illustration a, a skit that's yeah that's what i mean essentially you, you yeah. don't necessarily have to build the actual thing it's too wide to explain. Yeah, it sounds like role playing. I mean, you can bring in maybe a sample uh, of the product and then, you know, have people uh, work on it and then maybe express their opinions or something. Yep. That's probably it. Mm -hmm. How do you find these people is still always a challenge. Well, and how are they going to understand all the documentation? To support it, I mean, I think it's fine to do multivariate testing with multiple prototypes uh, for user research. But it she, I, I, my sense of these fairs was that we're looking that they're really to kind of not really road test the business model, but to actually put it in front of executives and explain it, kind of like how you would unveil the business model canvas. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think there's something said to keep it at that high level because if you want to put a prototype in front of some people, um, which I guess can be viable in certain circumstances, but depending on what you're making, um, you know, you, you've immediately jumped to a solution or you're putting a proposed solution in front of people and people might get too excited on that. Great, what you're trying to say, pick the strategy and we'll work out what that looks like later. Um, and, and, I, and I think there could be danger. Uh, I mean, I, I, I get it, it's great to get by, and you might want to sort of say have some kind of like animation or some kind of mock up, but even, you know, you want to wow them and get them to get excited about it, but at the same time, you don't want to sort of set expectations for good or bad reasons. Because yeah. uh, I can imagine that even once you picked your strategy, what that actually ends up looking like, you know, what that then delivers could be. One of all sorts of different you know, ways of, of solving the problem. So, I mean, yeah, so you know, that's my thoughts. Would, would any of us advocate doing a fair for our clients or for the companies we work for? Do we, do we think we could pull it off? Do you think we would need to do this, educate? We'd certainly need buy in at the high level, but do, you, do we think that we could just go out and execute one of these or it seems to me we'd have to hire either the authors or people who are highly familiar with the book and its techniques to really come in and run this thing uh so i <clears throat> for my industry where i'm working right now especially it's so highly specialized it's rfid you know tech hardware radio frequency uh, software. So I think that it's so highly specialized. And in that sense, I could see myself doing one here internally because the the core offering isn't as broad as Amazon or something. It's kind of like when you narrow in the scope of a project, you can get more interesting ideas if you, you don't have to work with a bunch of other things in your head. So um, because ours is so narrow, I think that we could do it, but I cannot see it with such a you know, a broad place like Amazon because there'd be too many different ideas in different directions. So I think that's why it worked well for the toilet paper because it's such a narrow scope, people can go run with that with some really creative ideas. Right. Like coming, I like that, like coming up with new ideas or repurposing old ideas specifically. And maybe, it, maybe even if your company's divided into product groups that they come up with. Yeah. Yeah. All this material for their group, and so maybe some, some maybe there's some duplication between the groups, so there's split testing. Yeah, I, I don't know if the book brought it up, but I, I think that should be talked about. The um, 
if this does happen, to have a very specific, very, you know, like research, a very specific uh, idea or concept you're working with as opposed to just uh, mind, mind mapping or brainstorming. Like, go generate a bunch of ideas and then just look at really using that thing. Do we think the whole fair is an alternative approach to design thinking or parallel? I think more as parallel. It, it always makes me think that at some point it might be more time and resource efficient to actually fall back into the, the more typical product design process or product development process, uh, bypass this uh, initial workshop and actually quickly validate ideas or even just one idea and then come prepared with a more um, established case to, to defend, essentially, a bit like a thesis. And if it doesn't work, you, you save all the hassle of putting together this super intensive workshop and you can take another stab at testing another idea. So I think it could be a synthesis just for this particular point in time and then make the, the big conference, so to speak, more, more efficient. I think the general idea is nowadays, uh, I don't know, Jamie or um, anyone else, who, uh, if you guys have heard of, uh, um, I think, what's his name, Gottlieb? And he has suggested using uh, lean and agile thinking in tandem with design thinking. And that seems to be what a lot of management prefers. They, prefers, they prefer that we do the research and then implement something, validate something by implementing something and then keep doing the research that way. Is, uh, are you guys familiar with that whole new methodology? Well, it's not. Yeah. It's lean UX. It's just derived lean, from lean yeah, startup, yeah. and so um, I think that's that seems to be what the management wants us to do out here as well. Except there's no strategy component to lean UX. Right, right. It's it's the same thing with lean startup and and design thinking, where they're not looking at the market space and. Um, I don't know. I I'm not a big. I mean, I think the lean UX thing personally is a fad, but that's just, I, see, okay. I mean, could yeah. work. We could also so why don't we do why don't we Google Sprint around it? But again, it's like jumping into prototypes. You know, it's like what are we prototypers or are we are we strategists? You know. <laughs> yeah, that line's getting more and more blurred. That's that's the way I see it, I and mean, that's what I was. Uh implying where it's it's blurred but also again to me it's it's always a little unclear how do we bridge the the creative innovative part of the process and nail it down back to the reality of validation with with all the more solid methodology methodical methodical research that leads to it yeah Okay, Millie, do we hit your question? Should we, you want to grab it? Yeah, so, right. So I was thinking about this whole Blue Ocean Fair and that the whole process could be susceptible to biases or groupthink or like a really spectacular presenter or a team that was able to make fabulous slides or do a prototype or do a great storyboard. It could bias people towards picking those ideas just because they had a super presentation. Um, so I wondered about ways to reduce, reduce the impacts of such things, because by doing it in this workshop format or fair format, it, you know, there is a final decision that comes out of that process. And so if the process isn't managed carefully, you could be running with the wrong choice for the wrong reasons, potentially. So I, I don't know what people think about ideas to, to reduce or eliminate groupthink and bias within the framework that they set out in the book. I don't know. Let's say we were to walk around a big uh, open office space. To, I mean, imagine this in real life. And, uh, you know, you'd walk from kind of like large cubicle to cubicle that each one was comprised of a monitor that maybe had a demo and then big diagrams on the wall the Blair utility map and and all the other tools and that somebody was there to walk you through i mean maybe the way to avoid that is to have 
a tour guide who walks you through all five or six ideas and in each group follows that tour guide or something like that. So there is no, it's not like a group leader presenting it, but rather one person presenting all of them and that there's a script that they follow um, to keep it so that everybody's getting the same amount of time, everything's being explained in the same way from A to B and and then being shown the prototype and then they could all, you know, then they could do their dot voting exercise based on what they think based to me, balancing viability, you know, and uh, in terms of getting the product out there and then also, you know, profit margins, all these other things, <clears throat> value innovation so forth. Yeah, I think the dot voting was where, like, red flags started going up for me, because I feel like that would definitely need to be done in a not public way. Like, I think it could really be influenced if everyone sees, oh, well, everyone else is putting their dots on this, one. I must not be getting something, even though I think yeah. this other one is a better idea. Yeah, I was, I, th I was thinking about that, and I think you could run, like, a sort of a digital or online poll, um, and, and then just reveal the results once the votes are in. Um, obviously, you need a bit of a tech set up to do that, but it's not hard to achieve. Um, if you want the results in real time, the other option is just to fill out a form, like a ballot form, and something, stick it in the box, but then you've got time delays to try and analyze that stuff. So, like an online vote seems like a good solution to that one. I think that's, that's genius, uh, P. That they, they, it should just be an online little form that everybody fills out, and it, it pulls uh, yeah. all the. You know, and then at the very end, they can sort of see and talk about from the top down. I like the idea of like looking at the ones that got the most votes and the ones that got the least votes, throwing kind of the middle ones out maybe, uh, for, and saying, why is this one so compelling? Why is this one not? I, I totally agree with that. That's one thing that got me to sticker votes. That method works great for in-house ideation because, you know, tight group, everyone together can talk about it. But, uh, it, and I don't know where the research is, but if you're on the fence about something and A has like 20 votes and B has five, there's something that happens there and you can visibly see it. So it's going to sway the vote. So, yes, keep it online anonymous. Um, <laughs> don't do the public stickers because that's just going to snowball for the one that gets the most votes. And that will be unfair, unfortunately. Yeah, I was thinking maybe the presentations could also be done using some sort of standard. You know, like yeah. instead of letting each team go off, and maybe one team has a fabulous visual designer as a team member, <laughs> and the other team is just using the Google template. Um, but yeah, yeah. Have maybe some consistency in how those presentations are done would seem to be advisable. Right. Yeah. And they could also be recorded, you know, for people that couldn't attend it and then they could come and, and potentially vote and there could be a QA. and a yeah. I, th I, think if you, I think if your organization is large enough and you've got someone that's really like slick at designing presentations, just get by them for a day or two, uh, buy their time for a day or two and get them to deal with it, just give them the content. And just ask them to make it look cool because this is your one opportunity to blow your like see yeah. your people away. It's true, and you know, so you've got to nail it, you know, and practice it, practice it lots. <laughs> you know, I do like that idea, but I have one thought, and I'm curious what you all think about it. So, I know when I'm working on a project for a long time, and you know, you spend time with it, you get really excited about it, and want to present for me, it's like the closure to the product, you know, like I get to present my idea, I get to pitch it, and you're just passionate about it. So while I understand the need to have standardized to mitigate, you know, fantastic, uh, not performance, but presenters, uh, I personally think it might be trapped a little bit from the overall people that did it and the overall experience. So again, this fair is tough, right? There's so many different variables. So well, what do you think about that the idea that presenting is kind of part of the project and the experience itself? Definitely. I mean, I think you want it to be reasonably standardized, but to have like, like what both you and Pete are saying, raise the level, have the standard be like, these are going to be amazing looking presentations with great right. presenters. Right. 
Yeah. And maybe, maybe there's the opportunity, sort of, you know, before, you know, you'd like to think you could, you know, you're near the end of the process, you put so much work in, that there would be a, a, it would be a good opportunity to just factor in some time for everyone to cross-check each other's presentations. So you could, you could run the presentation, I mean, if only lasts an hour or whatever, just run it, like, one day with all the teams and just critique each other's work. Because you want, you want everyone to have the best chance of, of doing well, you know. Unless you're just totally invested in your own strategy, I think. Um, but you know, you could, you could do it internally if you process first and just give constructive feedback and stuff. Yeah, like That's a great idea. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so we have and that also preserves this concept that it really is a team effort. Everyone is rooting for the best idea to come out of the process. And it's mm -hmm. not so much that you're invested in the one that you and your small team worked on. You're invested in the entire process working well. Sure. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, it similar reminds me of uh, Steve Blank's Lean launch pad events where they break people into teams and then they ultimately come up on stage and present them just like any pitch fest i mean i guess this is different you're walking from kind of booth to booth or whatever i don't know well i like all these ideas i feel comfortable now that it wouldn't be overly biased or group group think saturated <laughs> so yeah. thank you I, th I think what's quite interesting as well is that this is, you know, because it's mainly focused around the case study, uh, you know, we're talking about a humongous like, global enterprise, you know, uh, and it'd be interesting to see how that would then, and um, how this process would translate, it's like a, a time of a startup, for example, um, you know, particularly if you're going after funding, you need to get some people in to sell them a new idea and stuff, it's, uh, um, yeah, I'm sure, it, I'm sure it would, you know, map okay. Um, but it's just interesting when you have, you know, a limited number of people in your team to do all this stuff, you know, you know, you might be the blue ocean strategist that's come up with all of it, you know, so, um, so yeah, it'd just be interesting to see if they could have given some examples of the smaller scale side of things too. Yep. Okay. Well, I think we covered the Blue Ocean Fair quite a bit. And I did notice on 244, they give this outline of how to present it and so forth. And I think we, I think it'd be the type of thing you have to do a couple before you feel confident doing, doing them for real. Uh, should we move on to David's question? Is this, or is this still, we're still in the fair land, David? Is David gone? No. Oh. He might have dropped out. There he is. Hi, David. I'll read his question in case. I think as a, a voting is a means to avoid, which is sure, uh, can we often say we don't care one way or another. We look to see who seems to care the most. We, yeah, it's the same thing with our concern around the, the voting. So we sort of figured out a workaround. David, you back? Mike's not on. How about we talk about, David, are you there? Do you want to put it in the chat window? I forgot to open that. There we are. You lost audio. Okay. Can you hear us, David? Oh, man. Everyone's dropping out. Oh. Who else dropped out? I'm still here. We're all here. <laughs> I'm still here, but I also lost the for a little bit. Hmm. All right. Well, should we tackle this question until David gets back? Or, I mean, wait to t tackle it or do something else? Uh, are there any questions after it? Well, <laughs> I think we got all of them on the fair. Oh wait, someone's calling me. It must be him. Hello, David. It's David. Hi. Hey. Yeah, David. Okay, we got audio. Do you want to? T can we talk about your question about the examples? Okay. Um, 
see the examples number five. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I read about um, the Citizen M and Wawa, but I didn't see a good link to what is what I've quoted here from the beginning of chapter 13. So I'm, I'm wondering if anyone else can help me understand the link. They're, they they say very clearly you can make a lot more money by setting targets. So that's my question about uh, setting targets. Did they? Does anyone? Can anyone else give any illustration or example? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can't sort of give any specific figures that, that I've seen as targets for cost reduction or for, for, for profit, but um, yeah, I think I, the, but the general kind of um, thing I was thinking about regarding setting those targets is that um, you know it's good to be aggressive to try and get your cost down if you really want to improve your margin, but it's um, I suppose you've got to draw a line somewhere um, before you start sacrificing like value. Um, just to drive costing. Because I, I think you mentioned it in the book, you're sort of like, you, you, you could sort of be back into the red ocean if you, if you don't get that balance right. Yeah, when I got to this section, I actually flipped back and said, wait a minute, did I miss something? Did we set a strategic price? Mm. And I couldn't find it. And um, I mean, I guess it's maybe embedded in some of some of the other steps, like looking at the economic picture. Um, but I think I agree that the point of the target costing was to keep keep you in the blue ocean so that you're not starting and then building up value and adding cost because that's, that's definitely not the goal here. Yeah, no, she's, guess, uh, go ahead. Unless, unless you end up just being at a bread ocean for one, and just wait for other people to join you. Yeah, I really liked the section later here. We didn't have any questions about it, but the idea of the uh, workers and empowering them to understand your strategy and value proposition and rewarding them for carrying that out, I thought that was really... You know, it's obvious at one level, but also really thought-provoking. Yeah, I like that. Forgotten. Yeah, I mean, um, I I feel like that there's a much. Maybe either I'm more attuned to it now, or I'm just seeing it. Like when I was traveling last year, um, doing workshops around uh, a lot of places in Eastern Europe. Like in Romania, I saw these massive billboards uh, in uh, Bucharest that like took up entire buildings that said, uh, you know, certificates in customer experience. And they're basically like these training programs for people, uh, you know, not necessarily even going to college that they that wanted to work, you know, uh, you know, at hotels, for example, or restaurants, uh, so they could learn more about how to work with customers um, so that the customers feel like they're being heard, um, so that they can understand what their needs are, and it's like a, uh, you know, a lot more of an empathetical stance. And I think that is, I found that definitely, like, really, I like, the only other like the one company that I think, or the two companies I think about that are just killing it on the customer experience are uh, Apple and uh, Virgin Airlines, you know, where, you know, we know when we go to Apple that we're not going to have some jerk off, uh, you know, person working with us, that they're going to, that they're going to know a lot about computers they're going to be kind of hip and not like ironic and <clears throat> you know they, they're just like trained and, and it's part of their brand but it's like really uh i i feel like though even how apple works it's almost like its own fair like you can go in and just play it's like a museum play with the computers and there's no high pressure sales at all 
and it's clearly working for them. You know, and I, I think we're seeing that with Tesla as well. Um, you know, they just have these storefronts um, where you can go and, and try out the cars. And, and I think with Virgin, it's more of an end-to-end -end experience. And I'm sure there's other airlines that are also great. JetBlue used to be pretty great. Um, where I feel that the... I, I don't know how they're going to decide on how to give these people bonus points. Is it all based on surveying? Because I feel like everything I do now, whether I <clears throat> apply to get apply to get solar or, or take a take a train ride, I'm getting surveyed constantly. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> like at Wawa, they said that, or Citizen M, the ambassadors can earn or lose a 30% bonus each month based on 100% on customer satisfaction. So that does sound like surveys and things like that. Uh, and then you're asking your customers to do something else for you. Of course, then you could have, yeah, I mean, in the Wawa example, they had stock ownership, and that goes a long way towards making people motivated. Right. Yeah, I, think, I think there's lots of ways to do it, and I, and I think what's good about, it's good that they call out the need to engage people who are able to a level of the organization, get them to buy into what they're trying to achieve, but it's almost independent of you know, any given blue ocean strategy or anything you do, you know, it's more just like, this is what our brand is, you know, and we want you to get involved in that and, and represent it. And then if there's anything specific that you need to be trained on regarding whatever we're now introducing, we'll feel that later. But um, I thought these were just good sort of call outs to say, this is how you should treat the people. Um, anyway, and get all of your employees engaged. So, but I think you won't know, there's, there's multiple ways of doing that, and it'll probably just depend on your own. You know, industry and culture and blow, like you know what your brand is and that sort of stuff. So, um, but you know, it, but I think it, you know, going out and actually speaking to your employees and find out what matters to them, I think is pretty good stuff. That's true. Right. That, yeah. That's called frontline research. Uh, I've seen that, where it's basically the people who are on the front line, the customer service people. And, and I hope we see a change in the industry because where we, we've gotten to the hell of these robot calls where we are completely frustrated trying to get customer service. And I think by having people who are trained to hear us out and to actually resolve our conflicts uh, is going to win business, uh, either win a customer back or keep them from... Uh, keep them, avoid churn and then, and then win new customers. Mm. It'll be interesting to see then how that kind of develops as sort of AI and you know chatbots and stuff kind of progress down the line. Because I know quite a lot of companies think in a you know chatbot sort of the way to basically cut their customer service thing in half and save them loads of money. Um, you know, which can be true, but if it's not done well, um, you know, it could you know damage your customer's experience that badly, I think. So um It'd be interesting to see how you could install that technology in a nice Well, what I saw yesterday in a chat was uh, a company that was touting the fact that you were about to talk to an actual friendly person in, you know, Portland, New York, and New Haven, or or New Haven. But they were actually facing that head on and, and turning it into part of their value proposition. Mm -hmm. I read so the Angela may be swinging the other way. Yeah, I, I read a little uh, post on uh, uh, Wired magazine uh, where they had a little uh, series of asking questions about etiquette in the digital age. And the question was, is it polite to ask someone on the other side of the chat whether they're a bot or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have done that before. And then the other person like, no, I'm a real person. <laughs> Did you try to ask Siri? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, well, I did have, just quickly, I also read this article the other day, which was, had some horrendous, like, clickbait title of, like, like, uncool is the new, new cool or something, or, like, the death of cool or something, so, apparently, um, we, we, we're now in the post-cool era, where, where everybody's expecting that, yeah, we're, everyone's expecting their, their brands to be a lot more transparent about their, you know, their practices, and be more ethical, be more, 
you know, socially responsible. Um, so, and, and, and maybe, you know, having more, you know, human contacts will be a differentiator for that. So, you know, you could be like, right, you know, chatbots might not be around for a lot longer. In these uncool brands, anyway, maybe the cool brands will still be the chatbots. Yeah. Yeah, it just reminds me of this whole uh, paradigm that we went through. Apple started with this cubomorphic design, and then we have uh, more of the the flat design that came on afterwards. And now what you're seeing is material design, which is kind of a mix of both. So it's pretty interesting just seeing parallels of that. Yeah, I have the Citizen M customer perspective map up on the... Yeah, and, and this is probably me just being angry about it, but there seems to be like an infinite, infinite you printing loop in there, and there's no <laughs> arrow pointing to where the high growth comes from. It's just, it's just there. <laughs> yeah, I, I was wondering if this should be like a business model canvas, you know, and it would yeah. be a lot more easier to read. Yeah, I, I, I thought that'd be a good candidate for a business model canvas. You know? Hmm. Okay. Well, let's see. Before we do our look back, I think, are there any other... I mean, I don't know. When I read through some of the stuff, it's just... It's my same kind of beef throughout the book is so many of the ideas are I, I, you know whether it's like oh well why don't we do the blue uh, the uh, business model canvas here as a presentation tool or this is like design thinking or talking about the non-customers this is jobs theory and then I get to this like this part of the rapid testing and I'm like can we not at least call out uh, lean startup or customer discovery like none of these ideas are uh, original and I don't know I'm curious about your perspective like throughout their entire book there are, aren't really uh, I, mean, I think they might have some footnotes in here but in general they're not uh, trying to tie together all of these different contemporary business strategy, uh, either frameworks or, or theories into the book and instead really create this holistic uh, methodology um, that touches on uh, a lot of them. And so it made me wonder, is it because they are, they've been at it for 25 plus years and they're basically, you know, since they wrote Blue Ocean Strategy, you know, in, I get, when did that come out? 2005 or something? I don't know, a long time ago. And then, and, the, and, and it was a prescriptive book looking at case studies and now, you know, probably what they heard was people wanted to learn how to apply it. So now we have this group, this book, which I think is an excellent step in that direction. But for me, you know, and I think I vented this in the first talk, in the first meeting, is this not, it's like not tying into any of these other theories uh, or strategies that are out there for context or for reference, for, a great, for a greater reference on how to do customer discovery, check out Steve Blank. Or here's another way, is it intentional by them to do that? Uh, because once it's like going down a road, then all of a sudden you have to credit everybody, which I tried had to do in my book. Um, mm -hmm. Or is it um, unintentional? Or intentional actually from, for, because it's like, hey, these are our ideas. We've been thinking about them before any of these other trends started. Um, and here's how we do them. Uh, is it possible that they're coming from a different universe? So that all these um, 
process methods that you just described <clears throat> in, the, in the world of linear, smaller startup product invention, not necessarily product reinvention, um, are, are just slightly off, off their path. I wouldn't call it big path because it's a new path as well. But they may not be aware of this. Because it seems, it seems to just almost ignore it. And my thought is always of how we may need to synthesize some of it in. And potentially this looks like a, a set of tools, but not necessarily a prescription for a good cake that needs to be followed step by step. You didn't think that the steps in order to do them, like if we were to now apply them, you know, let's say we worked at the same company, wouldn't that be fun? Um, and we were like, oh, let's say we had to have a blue ocean sure. fair, you know, like could we use the book as a guide, um, you know, to, to actually do that. And it, you know, if we compare it to, you know, Google Sprint, they lay out like day one, day two, day three, day four. I feel they give us the tools and they explain how to use them and they give us examples. But at the same time, I'm still, even looking back on our fourth recording, the, our third one with, with Pete running it, the buyer utility map, like we all were kind of like, I don't know, pretty, we're smart people, but did we figure it out? Would it take a day to figure that out? That's where I feel that the tools themselves that are, are great and uh, the process that is provided, I'm thinking about it right now and how to see if I can implement some of these with, with the people I work with. And there's these questions that we keep on bringing up. They, they really boil down to the fact that we need to have a way to think about it and see how we can either modify it or synthesize it with more either extrapolating some of these and, and adding the, the, the needed kind of thinking or ideation processes that need to be in there um, or potentially in some cases use the tools in a more independent ways because there's not always the the readiness and the, and the resource availability again I'm, I'm talking out of my, my personal point of view to to run the whole process and have the highest level stakeholders weigh in in such a way that is described here and we mentioned before that it, it seems to be um, geared up towards larger, more established organizations rather than small and, and nimble groups that, that really try to launch something. I always ask myself whether this could work for a brand new product that really tries to hit a completely new market or whether it's a better fit for an existing and established offering that then needs to figure out how to reinvent itself, the value innovation part, to, to hit the blue ocean. That's a great point. Maybe. I definitely have this feeling of wanting to synthesize what I was reading in this book with other things. I mean, I actually like went and got the Google Design Sprint book off the shelf. And I was like, I really need to like look at this again and see like which parts of these are like overlapping. Where is their added value if we synthesize the approaches? I have that same feeling that both of you are talking about. I suppose one benefit of not calling out specifically um, these, you know, the various different sources of information you can get to is that for people that are really time poor, you know, they're not faced with like, okay, this book promises me I'm going to go from red ocean to blue ocean with just this book. And if I then have to go and read three or four other books actually do it properly, then that's a whole different kind of ball game. So, um, so I can kind of, so it may well be deliberate, you, you won't say, it might be deliberate of just saying that just stick with the process that we've given you modify it to your needs if you need to, but if you follow this process, we've done it enough times, we don't need to work with someone else because we've done it and we know it works. Right. Maybe. I mean, if you think about design thinking, um, you know, I mean, my biggest complaint from my experience is it's when it's, in, in so many cases, the way the people running it didn't know what they were doing and it just felt like, felt silly. But when IDO is hired to go in and do it for the companies, then it's done correctly. When Cooper was hired to go in and teach companies how to do personas and the and and the research, it was done correctly. And same with the, the you know like Osterwalder out there with with um, you know same with any of us with our methodologies and maybe. 
maybe, I, I don't know if this is the takeaway how-to book. I, I feel like it's an introduction and, and, and I would bet that companies, particularly in Europe, I'm not sure how well this book is gathering momentum, certainly compared to their first one. You know, with the 44 languages and the, and the millions of sales. Um, I, I, I almost feel like uh, we would need to call them in to a company I worked at to train the staff on how to understand and implement their techniques. So my microphone cut off. I mean, I, I cut off a little bit of that and I turned my video off. So hopefully this bit doesn't cut off. Uh, the one thing I was thinking when I was reading this whole thing during our conversation is we're all pretty versed in the idea of design thinking and strategy. So, and as part of why this was good, we have different perspectives. But when I was back home for Christmas and I told my mom about this, uh, she teaches this just this kind of thing at a collegiate level, but she's also super old school. So whenever she got into reading this, she loved it. So these ideas were new to her, even though she was a subject matter expert, but uh, she ate it up completely because she didn't know all the background and experience that we had. So uh, I think that it, it is incredibly valuable, but um, for, and I don't know if they marked it towards this way, but for the more old school type who don't necessarily know this kind of strategy exists. But um, for us, you know, we realized that this is, might be just rebranding of design thinking or anything like that. and. For me, at least, my best part of it, even though some of this stuff was, like Jamie said, another way to say design thinking or sprints, uh, it helped me learn some different lingo and different ways to present to a more business-oriented world as opposed to designers or UX people. That's really interesting that uh, your mom, I kind of found this stuff fresh because potentially if she's you know, if she's teaching this, uh, you know, university level, then whoever her students are, you know, could benefit from her teaching them about this stuff as well. You know? um, but I, I guess what's quite interesting as well is that potentially, like, you know, if you think about it, the old school side of things, that, you know, maybe for large enterprises anyway, the people that are at the top level, they'll be signing stuff off to maybe will have been working for, you know, multiple, multiple years. Right. And so when I learned that stuff, that was possibly a long time ago. They might not have had a chance to do fresh language about this stuff. Maybe, I, I don't know. But, um, so maybe it is a bit breath of fresh air for, for people that have come from a, you know, a, an older sort of educational sort of experience. Yeah, non-tech. I think it's almost like that is for yeah. non-tech, because us, us tech people, I think, are always like searching for the latest and greatest new methodology. Yeah you know, on trend and so forth. You know, so I could definitely see enterprises uh, trying to do this, but I do believe they would need somebody to to help them run this. And I wonder if we'll see a bunch of blue ocean shift specialists who can be hired uh, to help companies um, implement yeah. these ideas. I mean, I guess management consultancies have been doing that sort of stuff for 20 years, haven't they? So, True. You know, it's no different than... Yeah. yeah, I had that thought too. Yeah. So I guess we'll just see if we see a, a shift in more blue ocean practices. Well, we've got a few minutes left. Any thoughts about the whole book or about the messages of the um, medium? <laughs> I, I, I got ducked out for a meeting, but I mean, my favorite part was just hanging out with you all and talking about it. And like Jamie said, I don't think I would have made it through a whole book if I weren't told by this group. So thank you everyone for your ideas and hanging out with you all. And uh, I hope we can somehow stay in touch in the future. Yeah, maybe in another 10 years when the guys have written another book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Whenever, whenever Jamie finds time in their crazy, busy life to put on another book club for us. Yeah, yeah. We'll, 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 Absolutely. Well, I'll throw some books out there. I want to do this again. I feel like I'm. we just kind of nailed it down after the last few. Uh, and I want to see how people, what people think of them, uh, put, you know, the videos. Um, but yeah, I would... I. I, I definitely 
got a lot of value out of it and uh, I feel like we could be hanging out at a pub someday and, and it would be so much fun. Uh, <laughs> you name the place. <laughs> We're like literally all over the world so it's never going to happen but uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah I don't, you know I what you know any ideas for books if we were to do this again are we looking for like a a book at, of the, you know, like I wouldn't pick Eric Reese's new book, but I'm, I, for, you know, I did take that digital transformation project and now I'm trying to look at these digital transformation books. Is there any yeah, books? I don't know, it's a good, it's a good question because I mean, I, I suppose there's been a, um, you know, there's been a, a, a lot of value for me, I think, and uh, I guess sense the conversations for everyone of having a book that is quite close to our heart as people that are interested in sort of customer centric or you know research and design but it's written for a more general audience um and, and maybe you know i mean there's there would certainly be a lot of value in discussing like a very kind of pure ux digital type book but maybe there's some scope to say well can we look just to slightly to the left or right of that and see what we can buy from other disciplines and you know incorporate that ourselves so Whoever, you know, whatever the UX is are listening to what we're talking about can get insights of this slightly outside the world too as well. So I'd be, I'd be happy with either type, um, personally, but, be, um, but maybe that's, you know, some people thought maybe I can... Bye, Leo. Thank you. Well, cool. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, I want to thank you all. Thank you. And shortly say that uh, for me, it was mainly just a... Uh, self-provoking process and not coming necessarily from the business world and the connections and the blurring border lines are becoming more and more apparent. So that was my part of the experience. Excellent. All right, everybody. Any last words before I sign off? Let's do it again this later this year, Jamie, and pick another book. Thank you. Yeah, so I pick another yeah, book. Maybe yeah, likewise, and book would be great. It's a great thing. Oh. Yeah, maybe, maybe if we keep the Google Docs open or something, we can all just if we, if any of us see the cool book coming along, we can just suggest some options for you to select them. Yeah, let's do that. We'll dot vote uh, the next book <laughs> anonymously <laughs> to avoid bias. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everybody. I will miss you so much, and um, <laughs> thanks for participating in this and. Uh, Look out for tweets and LinkedIn promoting the videos. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.